thank you for coming. Um, it's uh, an honor and a privilege to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Mike Clegg. Mike is a uh, quasi-Davis native. He grew up here uh, uh, and began an auspicious career in plant biology by mowing Ledyard Stebbins lawn. <laughs> Um, he continued to do uh, undergraduate work here in Davis and then a PhD with Bob Allard in the Department of Genetics uh, here. After leaving Davis, he worked at Brown and the University of Georgia for a number of years uh, before moving to become Dean of the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences at UC Riverside. And then a few years ago to his current home in Ecology and Evolution at UC Irvine. Um, over the course of his career, he's worked on a number of topics, including, I just found out this afternoon, Drosophila population genetics, uh, including breeding system, uh, molecular evolution, uh, the genetic dissection of flower color and ipomoea, uh, and the topic we'll be talking about today, crop evolution and domestication. He has more than 150 publications to his name uh, and has received a number of awards uh, and honors, served as, on the editorial board and as president of a number of international societies. Uh, since 1990, Mike has been a member of the National Academy of Sciences and to this day is serving as their foreign secretary. Um, but perhaps uh, his greatest contribution to, to plant genetics and science, like his PhD advisor, Bob Allard, I think has been uh, the production from Mike's program of a number of excellent postdoc and PhD students um, that have impacted uh, plant genetics and plant evolution both here in the U.S. and worldwide. Um, a number of people here in the room, including myself, wouldn't be here if it weren't for the people that have come out of Mike's program. Uh, and with that, I'll leave the floor to Mike to talk to us about genetics and history of plant domestication. Let's see. Let's hope I get this right. Is that working? Can you hear me? <laughs> no? Okay. How's that? Yeah. 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 Great. <laughs> so, um, as you've heard, I went from kindergarten through the PhD at Davis, which, which makes me a pretty pure product of Davis. And I owe a huge amount to Davis, so it's wonderful to be here to be able to talk to you in this forum. I, um, I, I especially want just to mention uh, the person who I owe the most to, which is Bob Allard. Bob Allard was actually a, a very distinguished faculty member here at Davis. He, he was an undergraduate at Davis before World War II and then came back to Davis at the end of the war on the faculty in agronomy and did a, was trained 55 PhD students and something like 100 postdocs and visiting scientists during the course of a career of more than 45 years on the faculty here. Much of what I'm going to talk about today was stimulated in one way or another by my work with Bob. And <clears throat> what what I want to talk about is what genetics tells us about the origins of agriculture. The transition to agriculture was a huge cultural shift for hunter-gatherer societies. It meant uh, becoming fixed to a, a sedentary lifestyle and cultivating plants rather than gathering them, uh, not moving around. So this was a, a major shift in one of the the big questions that people have speculated about over the last hundred years is what drove this transition. And we know a moderate amount about the transition from archaeology and anthropology. <clears throat> we know, for example, that plant domestication uh, began at least 11 to 12,000 years ago, probably first in the Fertile Crescent of the Middle East, but soon after in other locations. And one of the questions that people speculate about is what triggered this massive shift in the early human economy. And a, an appealing hypothesis is that it was triggered, in, at least in part, by climate change because we were, it was the end of the Pleistocene uh, period of, of drying habitats in many areas, but also, even more importantly, a period of, of substantial climatic fluctuations, which meant that human resources were not as predictable from year to year as they had been before. And it may be these, this combination of factors which actually drove early humans to invent agriculture and to adopt a rather different lifestyle. One of the pieces of evidence that seems to support that view is that agriculture was invented presumably independently in a number of different parts of the globe. As I mentioned in the, in the <coughs> Fertile Crescent of the Middle East, uh, and the oldest 
evidence probably comes from this region, but at least 10,000 years ago in the Yellow River and Yangtze River valleys of China, um, squash appears to have been domesticated in Mesoamerica roughly 10,000 years ago, maize perhaps by 8,000 years ago. There was even a center of domestication featuring quinopods uh, in Middle America and uh, domestication of, of plants in Peru. So this simultaneous efflorescence of plant domestication and the adoption of a new economy which involved um, ultimately being tied to plots of land and hierarchical societies occurred almost simultaneously in a number of independent parts of the globe and this is one of the strong arguments for a climate change cause. So how, how do we know what we know about the times and places of plant domestication? Well, virtually all of this comes from archaeology and, and there are two key pieces of evidence. One is that modern dating techniques tell us uh, with a high degree of accuracy the times that the earliest domestication events may have occurred. And the other key piece of evidence is plant remains which feature what are called domestication traits in situ in archaeological digs from early periods so that you can see directly the physical evidence of human domestication of plants. And a key domestication trait that can be, <coughs> that often features in these kinds of investigations is the shift from uh, brittle rachis where the seed as they become mature, absize and fall from the stalk, facilitating seed dispersal to a tough rachis where the abscission process has been interrupted by a mutation that prevents abscission and retains the seed on the stalk. And <clears throat> these, the lack of an abscission layer can be seen in plant remains, charred seed remains from early archaeological digs. And so this provides a key piece of evidence that the materials which are recovered from these digs are in fact the result of human domestication of plants. This happens to be uh, the case in barley. Barley was one of the first plants to be domesticated in the Fertile Crescent. And <clears throat> one of the things that, that I'll mention later as well is that it, it turns out that there is, there's not one but there's two different genetic loci both of which produce this tough rachis phenotype and, and that will feature later in the talk because this discovery of two tightly linked but different loci causing the tough rachis or the non-shattering phenotype was made actually in the mid-1950s by Takahata in Japan um, and it has been used to argue that barley may have been domesticated more than once because if early hunter-gatherers who <coughs> would have naturally selected the tough rachis phenotype because they would have been able to gather its seed more easily and efficiently if they were using a stone sigh or if they were uprooting the plants from the ground, um, if they selected a mutant that produced that phenotype, why in the world would they select a second different mutant that produced the same phenotype unless that selection had, occur had occurred independently in a different location? So <clears throat> what, what does genetics have to contribute to this picture? And there are essentially three key pieces of evidence that we can get from genetics that help illuminate the picture of plant domestication and I'll, I'll illustrate these through the course of my talk. But <clears throat> the first is that mutations in genes can discriminate among populations that appear identical at the morphological level. So this gives you a way of discriminating among populations that, that you can't otherwise distinguish. Uh, the second is that we can use mutational differences to build a phylogeny, that is to provide information on the pattern of historical relationships among populations. And, and the third is that if we keep track of collections in a spatial context, we can make inferences about the spatial temporal context of change 
by mapping gene differences into space. And that'll be a, a, a key thing that I will talk about as I go along. So I'm going to talk about two case studies. One is barley and the other is avocado. And you might think about these as beer and guacamole. Um, <laughs> Barley, again, is a fertile crescent domesticate. It's the fourth most important cereal crop. Um, was probably, along with wheat, the earliest domesticated cereal crop. Avocado is a tree crop, a nutritious fruit with high protein content from Mesoamerica. Uh, wild barley is the progenitor of cultivated barley. And cultivated barley was domesticated from wild barley, which has the name Hordium spontaneum spontaneum. Um, Domesticated barley belongs to the same species, it's Hordium spontaneum vulgara. And wild barley is an annual grass which occurs over a large and climatically and ecologically diverse geographic region that I'll show you a picture of in the next slide, but it's a region that, expands, that extends over roughly 3,500 kilometers. And you can see here uh, the region from which wild barley is, is native, which extends from the eastern Mediterranean, Israel, Syria, up into Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, to the edge of Pakistan. And this region is actually bisected by a tectonic mountain range, which is called the Zagros Mountain Range. Some of the, the peaks of the Zagros Mountain Range extend to nearly 4,000 meters. And the black dots just represent points in space where barley accessions have been collected that'll feature in the talk that I'm going to give you. So the two questions that I'd like to address, one is, did domestication of barley occur more than once? What can we, can we make inferences about multiple domestication from genetic data? And can the spatial origins of crop genomes be resolved? from genetic data. Now, <clears throat> I put, this is sort of a simple-minded slide, but I thought I'd put it in just uh, on the assumption that this is a general audience. And so mutational differences occur over time, and this is an example. The A, T here represents a mutational difference in a stretch of DNA between two individuals, likewise the C, G. The frequency of mutation per generation is actually quite low. It's of the order of about five mutations per billion base pairs uh, <coughs> per generation in an individual. But if you imagine a large population, the expected number multiplied over all the individuals in the population is larger. There's a piece of, um, of jargon that, that's come into common use recently, and that is that these Polymorphic sites are often called single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. And so, uh, in case I use the term SNP, that's what it means. And the, the approach here is, is to take a sample of genes from the accessions that I showed you on that map and to sequence them from every accession. So we have data on a, lar a fair number of genes, actually 18 different genes. In each case, an excess of 1,000 base pairs per gene. Um, and they're sequenced from each of between 25 and 45 accessions across this geographic range. And these are very high resolution data, and they convey a lot of information. And I'd like to walk through in a simplistic way how we make inferences from those data. But first, to just give you a, a, a feel for the data, the, the, the core sample size is just 25 accessions across the geographic range of wild barley. Um, there are 18 loci. On average, about 1,350 base pairs were sequenced per locus, so it's a fair number of, of uh, comparisons. And in that collection, there are 699 SNPs. That is, there are almost 700 sites in this total collection which are polymorphic, on average about 39 per locus. And there's a statistic that we like to calculate in population genetics, which is a measure of the nucleotide sequence diversity per nucleotide site. And it, it, you can interpret this in a general way to mean that about roughly eight to nine in a thousand 
nucleotide sites are polymorphic, that is almost one in a hundred, that, that means a wild barley is pretty polymorphic, has a lot of mutational diversity in that geographic span, something that's close to tenfold greater than we see in humans. So wild barley is, is relatively diverse, not as diverse as maize, much more diverse than humans. Another, another piece of jargon that, that is useful and that I'll probably refer to is the notion of a haplotype, which is just the arrangement of polymorphic sites on the chromosome transmitted from one parent. That is, if we imagine that we have just a, we're thinking about just a single chromosome and these, and you can forget the red and blue for the moment, that these little pins represent polymorphic sites, then we can compare the arrangement on the first chromosome with the arrangement on the next chromosome. And we see that we can actually count the number of mutational sites that differ between these two chromosomes. It happens to be one, two, three. And that provides us a natural measure of the mutational distance between different polymorphic sites in the sample. So then we just apply that to the sample. And here's an example of applying that kind of reasoning. This is just building a network of relationships for one locus of, of the 18. This is a, a locus called the waxy locus, which actually produces an enzyme called sucrose synthase. And this network is the colored parts represent observed haplotypes in the sample. And then the open circles represent mutational states that we have to infer, but which did not exist in the sample, to get from one haplotype to the next. So there are two things that, that sort of hit you as you look at this waxy locus diagram. Uh, the first is that there's a, there's a large mutational diversity. There are only a few cases of a haplotype being drawn more than once in the sample. Most haplotypes are different and most differ from one another by a fairly large number of loci. Now here's another locus. This is the, the least diverse locus in the sample. This is PEP carboxylase. And <clears throat> it has a very different picture from what we just saw from waxy. Much less mutational diversity. Uh, most haplotypes are one or two steps apart. These two major haplotypes are about f five steps apart. Uh, and the coloring actually has a meaning. It represents different geographic features in this broad area. So uh, the blue we can think of as the regions west of the Zagros Mountains. And then the green just represents samples from the Zagros Mountains. And finally, the yellow are samples east of the Zagros Mountains. And this is going to become more important as I go along. But you can see that the major haplotype here is actually found in all three regions. That means that this haplotype had to move across the entire geographic span if it is unique, if it wasn't created more than once by back mutations. And we tend to assume um, that the probability of reoccurrence by additional mutations is negligible. So for the purposes of the talk, we'll assume that this is a unique haplotype that had to have migrated across the entire range. Now, here's a, a different picture. This just shows the distribution of haplotypes observed at another locus called ADH3. And, and what's more remarkable, or what the feature that, that certainly struck us, and which is noteworthy for this talk, is that there are quite different haplotypes found east of the Zagros Mountains and west of the Zagros Mountains. And these are depicted by the different colors and symbols. And there are actually a couple of recombinant haplotypes that are found within the Zagros Mountains. And in fact, the distance between these major haplotypes east and west of the Zagros Mountains is quite substantial. Uh, and it, if you do a simple-minded calculation, the genealogies that led to the western set of haplotypes versus the eastern set appear to have diverged from one another perhaps three million years ago. So there's a very deep 
genetic divergence between haplotypes east and west of the Zagros Mountains, this large tectonic range that bisects the distribution of wild barley. And so you can, <coughs> with that hint, you can return to the other loci and ask, well, um, do we see geographic structure in those as well? And it turns out that if you apply a, a simple permutation test asking whether nearest neighbors are, are closest in geographic space, the answer is that nine, half of the loci, nine out of 18, show clear evidence of geographic structure on the same pattern separated east and west of the Zagros Mountains. And <clears throat> you, can, you can also ask, well, is this plausible? You can, you can actually estimate rates of migration from the data applying a coalescent estimation process. And uh, that has been done, and when you do this, this represents, for example, migration from the Western to the Zagros, almost two individuals per generation. Western to Eastern, three and a half individuals per generation. Uh, going on the other axis, Zagros to Western, more than one. Eastern to Western, about one and a half. And there's classic population genetic theory that says if you have more than one migrant per generation, that's enough to offset differentiation by genetic drift. So there's, there's a fair amount of migration, and that's intuitively not surprising given what I showed you about the PEPC haplotype, that it must have spread across the whole region. This just validates the intuitive uh, picture. So <clears throat> discovering this kind of strong geographic differentiation, which persists in, in the face of migration, allows one to ask, was there a second domestication event east of the Zagros Mountains? And <clears throat> so now what I want to do is to turn to domesticated barley. So far what I've told you about is wild barley. It doesn't have anything to do with making an inference yet about the origins of domesticated barley. So as I've already told you, barley and wheat were domesticated between 11 and 12,000 years ago. Then they were later joined by other uh, founder crops that create an agricultural complex. Um, somewhat later, domesticated animals. And by about 8,000 years before the present, agropastoralism is spreading in every direction from, from, the, um, from the Fertile Crescent Ridge. And in fact, in, in this morning's New York Times, there's an article in the science section about um, civilization in the Danube Valley that existed six or 7,000 years ago, subsisted on wheat and barley, and was evidently part of this outward spread of agro-pastoralism. So <clears throat> I mentioned before that there are key domestication traits. One of them is the shattering trait, and that the shattering trait can be produced by either mutations at either of two genetic loci. There's a second very important domestication trait in barley, which is called uh, the two-road versus six-road phenotype. The six-road phenotype produces uh, more kernels per stock and is therefore a higher producer and desirable for agriculture, particularly for the primitive agriculturalists. And that is also produced by mutations at either of two different genetic loci, once again suggesting that there may have been a second origin for the domestication of barley because following the same argument I gave before, why would people select a new mutant from within a population that already presented the phenotype of value? This is the shattering trait that I've already introduced you to. Um, yet another is hulled versus hullless. This phenotype is produced by only a single genetic locus, so it does not provide evidence suggesting multiple domestication. So what can we do with the population substructure in wild barley that I've shown you to further investigate this question of multiple domestication? Well, we can Take samples of land races of cultivated barley. The term land race refers to primitive uh, 
cultivated materials which are grown in local regions throughout, um, throughout barley cultivation. They're ancient. Uh, there are very good samples of land races now maintained in, in germplasm banks, and so it's easy to access this material without having to travel to the Middle East. And <clears throat> one can then sequence the genes in the land races and ask, does the genetic data support a case for more than one domestication? So 20 land races were sequenced for seven of the loci which showed the largest pattern of differentiation. And in addition, 12 modern cultivars were sequenced in this sample. And <clears throat> this just shows you that the land races from the western and eastern parts of the range had essentially the same amount of genetic diversity on average. Um, so, what is then done with this data is to apply a, a nice algorithm, which is a, a model-based clustering method due to Pritchard and colleagues called structure. And the, the algorithm does a couple of things. One is you can say, you can specify that the data must contain a fixed number of subpopulations, and then it will make the assignments to subpopulations that maximize the likelihood over the data set. So, so in our case, let's assume that there are two subpopulations, one to the east and one to the west of the Zagros Mountains. The other thing to say is that we use the haplotype data to make the assignments. So we look at a haplotype and, and we ask, has there been a recombination event within this haplotype? And you can see recombination events in the data. Uh, because you can see where you must have obviously had one haplotype rearranged with another existing haplotype in the data set. And so you can define a haploblock based upon a non-recombined segment and use that as the basic data for assignment. And when you do that, <clears throat> you end up with a picture that, for the land races that looks like this. The blue represents the percent of Eastern ancest ancestry. Uh, the red is, well, let me put it differently. The red is the percent of Eastern ancestry. The blue is the percent of Western ancestry. And you can see that, that if you're looking at land races that are west of the Zagros Mountains, you have the genomic composition by this assignment algorithm relative to wild barley is of Western origin. If you move across into and across the Zagros Mountains, the genomic composition of the land races relative to wild barley is of Eastern origin. This says that the land races west of the Zagros Mountains had an origin west of the Zagros Mountains, and the land races east of the Zagros Mountains had an origin east of the Zagros Mountains. Because if they had had one origin for this sample of loci, they would look like the wild barley at the single point of origin. And then as you travel eastward, you, you see that there's a, an increasing fraction of western genes, and <clears throat> If, if you can look at that differently uh, by these pi diagrams that just show, again, the percentage of Western ancestry versus Eastern ancestry, and this pattern more or less parallels the, the classical Silk Road of travel between the Middle East and the Far East. And so it's, it's tempting to speculate, although the data at this point are far too sparse to say with any degree of certainty that some Western barley germplasm was also transmitted along the Silk Road together with Eastern barleys. Uh, barley arrived in China by at least 3,000 years ago and in Japan, but from both sources. So this gives us 
you know, some broad picture about the movement of barley germplasm historically, and it tells us with a fair degree of certainty that barley was domesticated independently east and west of the Zagros Mountains. Uh, more recently, um, a group in Japan has actually sequenced uh, both of the shattering loci and shown that one of them traces to an origin east of the Zagros Mountains and the other traces to an origin west of the Zagros Mountains, providing almost certain confirmation for two independent domestications. Now, another question of interest is what about modern barley cultivars? These are, these are the materials that are the products of modern plant breeding. Where does their genomic contribution come from relative to what we know about the geography of wild barley? And that's shown here. Most of the US and European cultivars um, are dominated by germplasm from the west region, from the Fertile Crescent region. Uh, the, it, it happens that if you look at um, cultivars from Asia, they tend to be dominated by germplasm from the eastern domestication region. So there's ample opportunity to exploit these two germpl pool, germplasm pools further in barley breeding. So <clears throat> what are we trying to do now with this data? Well, this is just a, a very preliminary analysis of 322 accessions of wild barley based on a da data set of, of barley snips from Brian Stephenson and Peter Burrell uh, in Minnesota. And <clears throat> the effort here, again, is to ask using the structure algorithm how many subpopulations of wild barley are there? Because if there are more than two subpopulations, once we have a denser sample mesh, maybe we can discover with greater accuracy where in the east barley was domesticated a second time. And also maybe we can find that it was domesticated more than twice. And what this shows is that in fact, if you look at about 3,000 snips and over 300 accessions, across the range of wild barley, that there are as many as eight subpopulations. And so there's real hope of being able to more precisely identify the region of the second domestication events and possibly discover that there were more than two. But that's where the story stands at, at this point in time. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is say a little bit about the guacamole side of the story. Um, which is based on somewhat more limited data, but um, this is avocado, tree crop of high economic importance, grown in California. Uh, avocado is actually domesticate of Mes Mesoamerica, but uh, the, and the largest producer of avocado is, is by far is Mexico, and particularly in the state of Michoacan. Uh, yeah, but it's produced now around the world. And one of the things that's been known for a long time about avocado is that there were three domestications of avocado. There's actually three different domesticated races, botanical races of avocado, which are each quite distinct from one another. There's a race called the Mexican race, which is a domesticate of the highlands of central Mexico. There's a race called the Guatemalan race, which is a domesticate of the highlands of Guatemala, which is quite distinct phenotypically. And I'll show you a picture that illustrates that in a moment. And then there's another race called the West Indian race, which is thought to be a domesticate of the lowlands of Central America. So West Indian is a misnomer. And <clears throat> there's some uh, archaeological data on avocado from sites of human habitation, particularly in the Oaxaca Valley, that, that indicate human consumption of avocado as long ago as nine to 10,000 years. And based on changes in seed size, um, some evidence of suggested human selection by five to 6,000 years ago. So humans were making use of avocados very early on and um, began to domesticate them a long time ago. Now this picture just shows Criollo avocado. These are wild avocados from the highlands of central Mexico that I actually picked up in a marketplace in uh, a beautiful little 
village called Malinalco in Estado de Mexico last year, along with other um, more cultivated forms of avocado. Now the Mexican avocado is distinctive because it has a fairly small, more or less spherical fruit with a black skin. You can actually eat the skin, unlike the avocados that you buy in the store. It's very thin. Um, a big stone with relatively little flesh around it. Um, these are pictures of, of some avocado cultivars from California. And most of these cultivars are actually inter-varietal hybrids. What, what happened with avocado was that it had been domesticated and used in Mexico and Central America for thousands of years, but it didn't really get into California until the latter part, the near the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And what tended to get into California were various intervarietal hybrids. And all of these uh, represent intervarietal hybrids. And this is the avocado that we use today predominantly in California. It's a single genotype. It's propagated by bud grafting. And this um, is called the Hass after a man who was a postman who found a volunteer tree in his small avocado orchard in Southern California in the late 1930s, and his kids discovered it tasted good, and that became the predominant cultivar in California. So that's the state of avocado breeding um, pretty much as of today. It's very ad hoc, uh, but you can see that there are substantial phenotypic differences among cultivars. And so there's a couple of questions that, that I'd like to just quickly touch on with you. One is, what is the genetic relationship between cultivated and wild avocados? Um, and then how much nucleotide diversity remains in cultivated avocados relative to wild avocados? Now here the sample of wild avocados is more limited. Uh, it's, it's based on mainly material in germplasm collections in Mexico and in Southern California, but it's fairly limited. The biggest cluster of accessions is from the highlands of Central Mexico. If we apply the same assignment algorithm to the wild avocado accessions, we end up with a very good fit to the three race hypothesis. Each of the three races is highly differentiated genetically on the basis of sequencing, in this case, just four different genetic loci. But a feature that comes out of the data that we didn't anticipate is that there appears to be subpopulation structure in Mexican, in the Mexican variety of wild avocado. And moreover, it appears to be distinguished on an elevational basis. So uh, the type which is mostly red are wild avocados found above 2,000 meters in the mountains of central Mexico. Those that are mostly yellow are found below 2,000 meters. And so now we can take a set of, wild, of, of cultivated avocados and ask, what is their genomic composition relative to the wild avocados based on four categories? The two Mexican categories, red and yellow, the West Indian, which is green, and the Guatemalan, which is blue. And what this tells us is what I've already uh, told you, that um, many of the avocado cultivars that we use today are intervarietal hybrids. So this is Haas. Um, it's actually a Mexican by Guatemalan hybrid, thought to be back crossed again to Guatemala. So it's thought to be a Mexican by Guatemalan by Guatemalan hybrid, and the genetic data fairly well conform to that. Um, another uh, common cultivar in California is Zutano. Much of its Mexican germplasm comes from the low elevation, not the high elevation subpopulation, and the rest is Guatemalan. So this provides a way for us to dissect the genomic origins of cultivated avocado and make some inferences about the history of avocado domestication that go beyond uh, what was known classically. Now, the other question that I'll just mention is the 
how much genetic diversity was lost in avocado during the course of domestication. And actually, it's very little. About 80% of the genetic diversity found in wild avocado is also found in cultivated avocado. Not surprisingly, because they domesticated three different races, and those all entered the uh, cultivated gene pool. So I hope that I've, I've argued that genetics can provide a powerful supplement to archaeology in inferring the history of plant domestication. And I'd like to just spend a couple of minutes touching on a, a slightly different theme, but it's, it's a theme that's dear to my heart, and it's based on the work that I, I do as Foreign Secretary of the Academy. Um, and th this has to do with using science to look forwards, not to look backwards. And there are areas of science that we use to look forward, to try and ask, what can we tell about the future? And one of them is demography. And <clears throat> we have, uh, we can make pretty, pretty accurate predictions of the human population size by mid-century. And right now it looks like it'll be between about 9.1 and 9.3 billion. Today it's 6.6, .6, so that's almost a 40% increase in the human population. Now these pictures just represent, uh, this was a slum out, outside of Sawito near Johannesburg in South Africa, um, the Coca Cabana beach crowded with, with people. Um, so there's going to be 40% more. And the other thing that we can make reasonable predictions about is that 90% of those new arrivals are going to arrive in the developing world. And of those, 50% will arrive in cities, in urban settings, which are ill-adapted to accommodate that kind of increase in population. So uh, we have big challenges. Then the other challenge that we spend a lot of time talking about is, is the challenge of climate change. There's been about a one degree centigrade temperature increase over this century, over the past century. And um, depending upon policy actions at the level of national governments, there will be anywhere from a two degree to perhaps a four degree centigrade temperature increase globally over the course of this, this century, the 21st century. The best case scenario is that we can get to about 450 parts per million of CO2 and adopt, um, and we'll have adopted policies that prevent further growth in uh, carbon emissions, uh, in that case, it would be about a two degree centigrade further increase. And that's thought to be adaptable, that we can probably adapt to that larger change. There are also huge challenges about global water resources and how those will be managed. This picture just actually shows where the Rio Negro joins the Amazon uh, in Manaus, Brazil. I, and it, it allows me to say that some climate models predict that the circulation system that provides much of the rainfall that drives the Amazon basin will be disrupted by global warming so that the forests of the Amazon basin will uh, suffer and they're a large sink for carbon. So there are positive feedback loops in this system which make it nonlinear and especially threatening. And then the, the final theme there are many others. There's biodiversity loss. There's a lot of other themes to mention. But the final one I want to mention, because it allows me to try and close the loop with the earlier talk, is food security. Food security is beginning to become a real concern uh, today. And <clears throat> with, 40, with a 40% increase in global population in the next 40 years, it's going to be a huge challenge. Uh, and moreover, this is superimposed on climate change, which will also impose large challenges for agriculture. And so far, global investments in agricultural research are inadequate to meet the challenges of the next 50 years. Uh, we're just not going to get there as well as we could have, which means that the younger people in this room and their children will suffer uh, a much poorer standard of living than might have been possible uh, had we adopted the right policies. So I want to close the loop simply by saying that once again, uh, 
the issue of climate change is going to pose large issues for human adaptation, and let's hope that we do as well as our Neolithic ancestors did. And so I'll just point to people who did a lot of the work. Peter Morell, who was just here a couple of weeks ago to speak, is a, at the university, professor at the University of Minnesota, and he really did a, the bulk of the barley work. Uh, uh, ha Feng Chin did much of the avocado work, and this is sort of the supporting cast from, from my lab at the time. So thank you. <laughs> well, I didn't talk too long. Huh? <laughs> so we'll feel free to ask some questions. We have uh, quite a bit of time. So, are there any questions for Mike? Yes. Yeah, you said it in, in your introduction, but you know, domestication is now viewed as a long-term process. Yes, yes, right. right. And Tori Fuller and others have summarized it very nicely. But you know, not all crops the same. It's certainly barley. It's taken thousands of years. Yes. And now at the same time, you talk about the event and and multiple domestication, whereas if you think about it as a process where essentially wild populations are being managed and, and going from wild to um, cultivated species over thousands of years, it's really where did what traits occur first and maybe some in the east that went to the west and others in the west went to the east, well, whereas basically both are building on wild populations. And, then, and so I wonder if you actually ask, ask the right question in order multiple domestications or is it basically one large domestication process in that larger region where exchange of pitch inflow? Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, in part, it's a, it's a rhetorical question. Um, but we would expect that, that if there were one domestication that diffused outwards, then the genetic material would look, look more like that point of origin. And in fact, that's that's what we actually see when we look at the, the east versus west is that even today, um, the land races look much more like the places where they were grown in a genetic context when compared to wild barley than they do to um, the other side of the Zagros Mountains, for example. So that's the, the state of the evidence. Now, what we'd like to have, of course, is is a much better sample mesh, which is what this other next project is about. But um, I, I, you know, my own view is that the weight of the evidence is that there had to have been more than one domestication because of the, the shattering trait, the fact that the two genes trace now to different origins, because the geographic differentiation of wild barley is so well reflected in the land races from which they were drawn. So that, that's the interpretation that I take. Now, it is true, however, that the domestication took place over, certainly in the Fertile Crescent, over several thousand years. It was a slow process. Uh, we don't know much about what happened east of the Zagros simply because the sampling bias in terms of archaeological sites is much poorer. But my own view is that the genetic data pretty strongly support two, two different domestication sites. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, what's the outcrossing rate in, uh, in barley? It's low. Uh, barley's what was the question, please? The outcrossing rate in barley. It's low. It's it's um, cultivated barley is about one percent, and wild barley it ranges from about two to seven percent, depending upon the collection site. There was there was a, a, a lot of work done by another student of Bob Allard's, Tony Brown back in the, in the late 70s on uh, isozyme variation in wild barley and measuring outcrossing rates in wild barley populations. So it's low. Interestingly, the closest relative to wild barley is another species called Hordium bulbosum, which is spread over a wide range along the Mediterranean basin. It's, it's actually an obligate outcrosser, self-incompatible. And uh, it's also quite diverse genetically. So sometime after the separation of Hordium bulbosum and Hordium spontaneum, presumably self-fertilization evolved. Now there's one other piece of evidence which, which suggests to me that that wasn't hugely long ago. 
and that is that if you look at linkage at disequilibrium within wild barley genes, uh, there's relatively little. Even within a thousand base pairs, uh, linkage disequilibrium decays by about a half, which is, which is not what you would expect for a predominantly self-fertilizing plant as it currently is. Yes, it, it does, right, it does. But um, even, even though the linkage disequilibrium is, is decays, you, you, can, you can actually separate the haplotypes based on recombination events and treat the recombined blocks as independent, statistically independent. Our concern was not to over count the data so that uh, sites which were within a non-recombined block were treated as a single observation rather than the number of SNPs. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I need to ask a question to make sure I understood something first. Yeah, that's okay. a real question. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, there was a discussion you had over here about land races versus uh, what I'd call maybe the more uh, direct domestication route, these two, two domestication histories. And I, if I understood correctly, uh, the situation is that the land races are both more diverse and that they have geographic structures yes. that's right. reflective of the wild progenitors and right. the structure of the wild progenitors. That's right. yes. And so if that's true, then my simple-minded interpretation would be that these uh, that there was an original two domestication events in the two domestication event model. And then over time, you had a uh, sort of repeated admixture that occurred geographic in geographically restricted ways with the wild material so that you reacquire the, the geographic yeah, right, structure right, of the wild right. progenitors. So, so my, my question is, can you s speculate, I, I want to propose something right. and you can right. ask uh -huh. whether you think this is right, why that admixture is retained. If it's just neutral, or alternatively, if that geographical range and the wild species have adapted variation for climatic conditions, soil conditions, right. that gets selected during a sort of a second phase of domestication that might have occurred in the land races, sort of contrary to the way people normally think about elite material, that instead it occur, sure. you have domestication now occurring as these sort of nodes on top of the original domestication. Yeah. And if that's true, mm -hmm. going back to this issue right. of, of global warming and so on, right. mm -hmm. do these land races offer potential to, yeah. to, to right. as opposed to wild right. material, that right. they'd be resampling of them, adapted yeah. traits, are they good places to think about? Right, right. Uh, presumably. Well, I mean, the first part of the question is the land races are, are locally adapted cultivated forms which have been cultivated by humans in situ for a long period of time. And so the, the question that we asked was if you know the geographic location of a land race, where does it line up with the wild barley? Is that, that, does that correspond with the geographic location of the wild barley? And the answer there is, is largely yes. But, but there's certainly some evidence for admixture as well. There's been some movement uh, in historical times, presumably. So you see that, uh, especially, I think, along that trace of the Silk Road. Now, uh, do the land races offer potential for future adaptation? The answer is certainly yes. The, we globally have invested a lot of money in international germplasm banks under that premise that, that we need to re maintain these materials because they provide a source of genetic diversity that can be used in the future. Uh, but you can think of each land race as sort of a locally adapted cultivated form but it may be adapted to a lot of different things. Uh, the cultural conditions in which humans were operating, what they liked, how it baked, uh, or, or you know, how easy it was to grind, or you know, local adaptive conditions. So it represents an adaptation to a complex culture and physical location, some of which may be useful, some of which may not be. But um, as a source of, of genetic materials, yes, hopefully. I, th you know, I think the key to the next 50 years is probably not so much genetic improvement, because it's already too late for that. It's better management. Um, <laughs> it's, um, 
adopting land use policies and water use policies which optimize the opportunities for taking care of the people who are going to be on this world. Um, genetic change occurs relatively slowly, even, even based on the technologies that we have available to us today. So that's my own view about how I would approach the adaptation to the next half century. It's easier to manage the environment. You can do that more or less overnight. <clears throat> the global biodiversity is gradually reducing uh, decade after decade. Uh, the past history of global climate change yes. somehow uh, did not impact that much because of the biological diversity that we have. Now, especially in the agroecosystem, our biological diversity is very narrow. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think you are going to suggest to at least uh, to the, the tree crop industry? which is based on very narrow genetic base, right, right. what do you think is going to be the impact on, on, uh, uh, on the tree crop industry? Here? <laughs> well, yeah, I, 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 I can't claim to be any kind of expert on the tree crop industry broadly. I know something about avocados. Uh, they're, they're reasonable genetic resources available in avocado, partly because they're, re they're maintained in Mexico. There's material in Guatemala as well as is here in California. So, you know, I, I don't think that we're threatened by a loss of those, those resources, but it's a public policy decision whether we maintain them. So the California collections are maintained at a UC uh, uh, site called the South Coast Research and Extension Center close to Irvine. And if um, UC as a policy decides that that land is worth a lot more uh, for development than it is for the maintain, maintenance of the various plant materials there, it's gone. Do, so. do you recommend broadening the genetic base of all these crops, uh, broadening the genetic base? Yeah, to the extent that we can do that. I, you know, I, I, I think the trade-offs, my, my own view is you have to look at what the different trade-offs are. I, I think we've made an important and valuable investment over the last half century in maintaining genetic resources. Uh, they're still eroding because of the rapid expansion of monocultures and modern agricultural practices almost everywhere in the world. But um, we've made an important investment. It's important we sustain that investment. At the same time, um, you know, we've got to use the resources effectively to meet the challenges of the future. And, and we have a lot more tools now for plant improvement based on the technologies, a you know, very rapid pace of technological innovation that's occurred in the last quarter century, so, so you, you mean we still have time to deal with, uh, with the climate change issue? Uh, yeah, the foods? Traditional breeding and as well as biotechnological methods. I think that's a better a, a hope. I actually think that, that we have a better chance by adopting policies that, that are focused on more effective land management, more effective water resource management, that uh, focusing perhaps on, on crops that being, can be grown in more marginal areas, which are not, so we can bring in a little more land in production. The, um, the number of, the amount of land per capita uh, available today is, a, is about 0.5 hectares per capita on a global basis. It's gonna be less than half of that, or about half of that within the next 40 years. So you're gonna have to get a lot more production out of a smaller land base, and there's not much you know, other than expanding into marginal areas, there's not much else that can be done to expand uh, the land base. So, and, and a lot of that land base that might be exploited is important for other reasons. If we cut down the tropical forests, tropical forests account for about 17%, that is tropical forest destruction, about 17% of the global uh, carbon loss. So, you know, we're, we've sort of put ourselves in a box my own view is that environmental management is the easiest way out of the box, so that, that genetics is a slower, uh, long-term approach. Mm. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, I have collected this uh, so-called uh, wild six-row barley debate. Right. The whole Wild progenitor of the six row barley. Yes. 
Now, if that is true, that it's not the Y progenitor and it's a mutation from the cultivated barley, is it possible that when you find this uh, wild population on the other side of the Zagros Mountains, on the eastern side, that this could have been while uh, shattering the barley which uh, came from a cultivated population which was abandoned by the penguins who used barley for uh, animal feed? It's certainly, it's certainly conceivable. Uh, you know, these, these processes of diffusion occurred relatively slowly, particularly up into the higher elevations because you, the, the plant itself had to adapt in things like day length and and others, uh, so that diffusion process was limited but as you move uh, latitudinally by adapta slow adaptation of the plant to the changing environments. And, um, but, but wild barley doesn't occur in Tibet, so whatever was there you know, had to be brought in, a derivative of old cultivated barley or, or something. <clears throat> yeah.